All right, here we go. Today we have Michael Lynn Thompson, former high-ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood, who ended up leaving the gang and cooperating with authorities against other Aryan Brotherhood members. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, Vlad. It's good to be here. So you were born in 1951. Uh, where exactly did you grow up? Well, I grew up, um, there's a reservation on the east side of the High Sierra Mountains called Big Pine. It uh, sets between Bishop and Lone Pine. And I uh, spent approximately the first 12 years of my life on the reservation there. Okay, and your parents are partly Native American? Well, that I don't know. Um, it's a great question. I, when I left the reservation at the age of 12, I, was, um, I went to live with a um, um, Nez Pierce elder. He was half Nez Pierce, half Irish. And uh, he's actually the one that taught me my ways. Whether or not uh, I have any Native American blood myself, I don't know. I was raised Native. That's what's in my heart, so that's what I follow. Okay. Uh, and at that point, when you talk about up to 12 years old, uh, you lived on a reservation, then you moved. You know, was there any sort of racism early on that, that you were exposed to, or did you feel a certain type of way against other races, or, or not really? No, no, quite the contrary. Um, if there was racism, it was directed toward me by other natives uh, because of my fair features. And I suppose, you know, my elder used to tell me all the time that bigotry wears many, many feathers. And um, I think that's pretty much true. So, um, no, I, I, um, the only association I had with um, racism growing up was um, from other natives. Okay, so at 12 years old, you moved away from the reservation. Uh, and at one point, you actually became a bull rider. I did. I rode the rodeo circuit for um, a few years, uh, traveled the circuit itself, and uh, enjoyed that immensely. So then in 1973, a very serious incident occurred. Let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah, that was um, the murder of... Uh, Butch Nunley and Rue Steele. They were alleged to be two drug dealers that uh, were working uh, in conjunction with um, a man who ran a cartel at that time, John Solis. And um, it appears that uh, they had gotten themselves in debt or in some kind of trouble, so they uh, took it upon themselves to attempt to kidnap the daughter of John Solis, daughters of John Solis. And um, I let John know that that um, that was about to occur, and um, as a result, they were killed. And um, I was convicted of their murders, um, in addition to conspiracy. Okay, and you were convicted of a double homicide. Yes. Okay, and you were the only one actually convicted on all counts. That's true. So you didn't actually do the murder yourself. No. So who actually did the murder? Uh, that was Mike Sesma. He was the right-hand man for John Solis. And um, he carried out the, the execution of both men. Okay, so explain to you, you know, to me, with you not actually doing the murder, and you, I guess, trying to warn someone of an impending uh, kidnapping, how exactly did you get convicted of a double murder without actually pulling the trigger yourself? Well, it's under the felony murder rule which uh, has just been changed this last year through the legislation. And under the felony murder rule, if you're involved in a felony, regardless of the degree of the felony, in my case, um, Sesma had suggested that I had assaulted one of the victims. That assault was the predicate for uh, first degree murder and the conspiracy. That is now uh, actually before the appellate court, looks like this may be heading towards uh, exoneration. I maintained my innocence from the very beginning and throughout the course of my 45 years in prison. So, um, but now it looks like it's going to bear some fruit my way. Okay, and you're about 23 years old at the time? 22. 22. You're 22 years old, barely in your 20s, and you just got convicted of double homicide. Yes. And how many years did they give you at that point? It was uh, seven years to life. Seven years to life. Now, 
Seven years doesn't seem so bad, but when you added two life to it, it potentially could turn into a life sentence. And oftentimes you have these extremely long sentences that start out with a seven years to life. They do. What it essentially means, Vlad, is that in seven years, you're eligible for parole. So I was eligible for parole after seven years, but I went before the board 18 times. 19th time they released me. And that was after 45 years. Okay. I mean, how did it feel to be a 23, you know, a 22 year old who just heard to life? Mm. Yeah, I'm asked that question a lot. Uh, particularly people are interested in the emotion associated with that. The truth of the matter is, is that you're so caught up in attempting to survive and uh, adapt to the environment in which you've been placed that you don't have a lot of time to reflect on the fact that you're now serving a life sentence for a double homicide, um, regardless of the fact that um, you maintain, as I did, that you're innocent. Uh, you, okay. have, you have to contend with what you're faced with. Well, but I think you did say that around that time you started to consider suicide? Well, one time, yeah. It, it, it's um, a situation where I'd never been arrested. I'd never been in a cage before. I'd been out running the mountains, uh, working on Arabian horse ranch, riding the rodeo circuit. Um, so when I was arrested, it was one thing to be uh, put into a cage and go through the trial. Um, there was some movement associated with that, but I think the thing that settled with me most when I was transferred over to the prison and put into a cell was that I couldn't do this. Uh, the very idea of, of spending the rest of my life in a cage. And uh, not a very big cage at that. But um, that's actually the reason I wear this rock around my neck. It, uh, there's a very similar rock just like it up in the corner of the cell. And uh, having been raised native, uh, the rock people are significant to me uh, by way of totem. And so uh, with this rock sticking out, I just simply went up and put my hand on it. And um, in the spiritual sense, it spoke to me and it just said, it's going to be all right, little one. And uh, that was enough for me. Okay, so you get sentenced. And at that point, you got sent to Folsom Prison? No, I went to Tracy first. I went to Chino as the reception center. That's in Chino, California. And then I was scheduled to go to San Quentin but uh, they didn't have the bed space, so they uh, diverted me over to Tracy. That's a dual vocational institution in Tracy, California. Okay, so how long after Tracy did you end up going to Folsom? Okay, so I was at Tracy two years, and then I was um, special transport to Old Folsom Prison, and I arrived there, I think the end of 77. Um, went to the hole. Uh, I wasn't on the main line. I went into their, um, back then they didn't have a security housing unit. It was just the hole. And so that's where I was housed. Okay. So you come into prison, originally at Tracy, like you said, and you're 6'4", you could bench 600 pounds. Eventually. So you're a fairly big guy. Yeah. I weighed, um, at that time I weighed 285. I eventually went up to 310 and I wasn't lifting uh, twice my body weight at that time, 620. Eventually I did. Uh, but at that time I was hitting over 400 pounds. Okay. So you're a big, strong guy. I am. Essentially. Now, there was a situation that happened where uh, the Nuestra Familia, uh, aka the Norteños, yes. uh, attacked you. Well, no, it wasn't really the Nuestra Familia that attacked me. What it was, was um, essentially Border Brothers, what they call Border Brothers. Uh, now they have an organization that they call PISIS. But um, back then, uh, they were what was considered by the Nuestra Familia as um, expendables. So it was a situation where I worked in the chapel. That was my first job. And um, for maintaining the chapel, uh, I was given the garden between the two chapels to practice my Native American spirituality. And um, in so doing, you want to remember that it was against the law to do that back then. We weren't uh, able to practice our ways, nor were we able to speak our language. And uh, But the chaplain, I made a deal with the chaplain. He was a very open-minded individual. 
And um, he allowed me to use the garden to practice my ways, which I did. I was practicing my ways out there, and the priest in the Catholic chapel across from the Protestant chapel took issue with what I was doing. He considered it um, devil worship. And I think that uh, was probably because not very much was known about um, native practices at that time. So he sees a big white boy out in his garden uh, doing things that are contrary to his covenants and tenets. And um, I think he complained uh, to his parishioners, some of whom were Nuestra Familia. And then the Nuestra Familia made arrangements to have um, these kids attack me in the garden. Attempt to kill me, actually, in the garden. Okay, and how bad was that attack? Well, um, not very. Um, there was seven of them, and they had knives. That The knives they had are usually used for um, neck shots. They're called neck pieces. The boot factory is located in Tracy. And back then, when they made boots, they used to put a spring steel piece of um, a, a bar um, in the arch of the boots. And it was about uh, four to five inches long. So they would take that, then they would draw that back on both sides, put a handle on it, and it made an excellent neck piece, but uh, it really wasn't good for anything other than that. I mean, you could po poke some holes in an individual, but that's about it. But these individuals, um, you know, they, um, they weren't trained. They didn't know what they were doing. They actually had the pieces taped into their hands. And the only time you do that is when you're either afraid of losing it or having it taken away from you. And um, so they'd come out the side door. I was out in the garden practicing my ways. And um, um, <laughs> the point man, um, they formed a wedge coming out the door. And the point man, um, once I realized what was happening, I just simply um, knocked him out and um, rolled away from the rest that were coming out. And they kind of keystone cop fumbled out the door out into the, out into the yard. Um, and these were not individuals, like I said, that were, um, I've heard people say, oh, trained assassins. No, they weren't. They were, they were um, what, like I said, the New Western Familia calls expendables. And um, I doubt very seriously if they'd ever held a knife before. Um, so, and I doubt very seriously if they'd ever been in a fight in their life. But um, so, no, this, this was, when you say, you know, was it a serious situation? Certainly I took it seriously and certainly they were trying to kill me. And um, so I, I dealt with it accordingly. And this happened at Folsom? No, this happened to Tracy. That's actually, Tracy. What, this is actually what led to me going to Folsom. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, so that situation sent you to Folsom. It was one of, of a couple situations. Um, there was a major altercation on the yard and um, same day that I was also involved in. So I went from the garden setting. It was a lieutenant that opened the door and told me that uh, the people that had ordered my killing, the Nuestra Familia, were out on the yard as an alibi um, when I was going to be murdered. So um, he let me out to the main yard. And in conjunction with that, there were some, um, there were a couple of bikers I knew that were taking issue on behalf of another individual that had been threatened by the, by the NF. So the three of us, and perhaps there were a few more, we went out to the yard, um, picked up a few baseball bats, and um, <clears throat> began to um, handle those individuals uh, on the yard. And it was only after shots fired that uh, that was stopped. I was placed into the hole, let out two weeks later with no charges, um, pretty much set up in the unit, got into another altercation, and um, so smuggled a gun into the prison uh, with a box of shells and made a, um, a um, what amounts to a silencer, um, but it, it's not really a silencer because it was a revolver, but um, it suppresses the sound somewhat. So I was charged with a suppressor, but they never found the gun, they never found the, the cartridges, and uh, as a result, they put me in a car and took me up to Old Folsom so that uh, the old guard up at Old Folsom could convince me to tell them where the gun was at. Okay, one, once you got to Folsom, was that when 
gang started to try to recruit you? It is, yeah. The first to recruit me was um, Hugo Yogi Pinnell. He was their leader of the Black Panthers at that time. Um, he's oftentimes confused with the Black Rella family, but he was not a member of the Black Rella family. You had to be black to be a member of the Black Rella family. He was Nicaraguan. But uh, he'd been with um, the Black Panthers since about 1970. He'd just come from San Quentin, where he and George Jackson had taken over the Adjustment Center and uh, cut the throats of guards and white inmates there. Uh, Jackson was killed, but uh, Yogi wasn't, so he was sent to Folsom. So he had the yard at Folsom, and he was in the hole, and he approached me. What had happened at Tracy preceded me via the inmate grapevine, and uh, so he approached me and attempted to recruit me into the Black Panthers. I mean, were there any white people in the Black Panthers? I don't know that there was or wasn't. Um, I, I know at one time they established what they called the White Panthers, but um, I don't think that actually that they discriminated. Um, I think that if you were down for their cause, um, then you know you were recruited and used in whatever capacity that uh, they saw fit. So, like I said, Yogi was Nicaraguan; he wasn't black. Um, perhaps that answers your question, but. Uh, Okay, well, you ended up not joining the Black Panthers. I, that's and... true. I declined Yogi's um, attempt to recruit me. Mm -hmm. And instead, you ended up joining the Aryan Brotherhood, a.k.a. the AB. Uh, eventually, I did, yes. I was approached by T.D. Bingham at that time, and uh, he attempted to recruit me, and uh, when he did, I declined. Um, at that time, I was still fighting uh, members of the Black Panthers and the BGF, Usually pretty much every time I went to the yard. And in the time that I was at Folsom, I was in uh, 18 knife fights. And I'd been uh, shot um, numerous times with um, M14 shotgun and uh, one time with a 30 6 as a result of those knife fights. But eventually I did um, join the Aryan Brotherhood, yes. Okay. And, I mean, the Aryan Brotherhood is considered a very racist organization. I mean, in fact, the Anti-Defamation League calls it the oldest and most notorious racist prison gang in the United States. Well, the Anti-Defamation League is um, correct in part. I think that could probably be said now. But back then in the 70s, uh, I don't believe that was true. Um, the people that actually recruited me into the Aryan Brotherhood were Native American. And the four of them were members. Um, so, you know, the racism doesn't hold. T.D. Bingham, who attempted to recruit me at first, uh, is Jewish. Um, you know, people say, well, he's only half Jewish. Um, but his mother was Jewish, and he's Jewish, and he wears a Star David on his, on his body with pride. And, um, but he's not a practicing Jew, which is, to me, irrelevant. But back then, the idea of the Aryan Brotherhood, along with uh, the Black Panthers and the Black Guerrilla family and the Nuestra Familia and the Texas Syndicate, and the Mexican Mafia were all about controlling their resources. Racism was not high on the ticket. It isn't to say, Vlad, that you didn't have racists within the organization, as you did in every organization. But um, it, it creates a problem, I think, when we talk about the history of the Aryan Brotherhood or any other organization in so far as racism. Um, certainly now, uh, they should be considered uh, right up there. Um, with uh, hate groups and um, uh, the quintessential racist organization. Um, but that was an evolving uh, process over the last um, 40 years or so. Okay, and I mean, back then, were they, you know, putting like Nazi tattoos on themselves? I know it was like a, sh there's a shamrock and there's a Nazi swastika and, and they're used sometimes together or one Yeah, or that, that's fairly contemporary. No, you didn't have individuals with, uh, with um, swastikas. You had the shamrock, like so that's on my finger right here. And um, I don't know if you can see it. I can't get that ring off, but it's right there. It's, it's the only mark I have relative to the Aryan Brotherhood. But it was a shamrock and the idea of the shamrock was that um, oftentimes you'll see three sixes in the clovers themselves, and, and that was the, the Antichrist or the beast, if you will. And uh, really what it was was anti-establishment. Um, but you did not see the swastika. As a matter of fact, the knife fights I engaged in at San Quentin were with the neo-Nazis. Um, you know, I, I took out their, their so-called Fuhrer 
at San Quentin uh, because he was constantly talking out the side of his neck. And uh, when the riot would start, he and his other neo-Nazis were nowhere to be found. So I don't have a lot of regard for Nazis and never have. Um, and you'll find that true. But again, um, I'll say that uh, you do have racists in any organization. Did some individuals in the Aryan Brotherhood have um, swastikas on them? Not, not that I know of. Not at the time that I was a member. Okay. And the Aryan Brotherhood is headed by a 12-man council, which is topped by a three-man commission? It is now, yes. Okay, but back then, was the structure that way or no? No, the structure was that, uh, you know, you had one man, one vote. You didn't actually have that many members. And it was very difficult uh, to get into the organization. I didn't know, for instance, when I had declined TD's recruitment offer, uh, that uh, that's what uh, most individuals were shooting for, was the ability and opportunity to become a member. Um, so it was, you had very... I'll say this, you had influential members like T.D. Bingham and others, um, but it was essentially one man, one vote. Okay, so, you know, at one point, I don't know whether it was the same back then, but new, mem new members had to take a blood oath and take a pledge? Well, no, that is, uh, <laughs> you know, I hear these things all the time, you know, blood in, blood out is what it's called. And um, usually it's law enforcement that coins that term um, in order to describe the dedication of the individual that belongs to the organization. Um, there is no oath taken. There's no loyalty oath. Uh, the idea was that uh, if you wanted to become a member, that you had to get your bones. And you got your bones through combat. Um, and uh, I think that's probably true. Um, you know, getting your bones. It didn't require that you kill somebody, but that um, you put in work. Essentially, that's the term we used. Have you put any work in? And um, so, you know, to that extent, yes. But, you know, the blood in, blood out, you'll get that mostly from law enforcement, um, you know, who fancy themselves experts on not only the Aryan Brotherhood, but other gangs. But, um, you know, to me, they're the equivalent of, uh, you know, the weekend warrior armchair quarterback. Um, you know, their intelligence is um, lacking and uh, usually comes from individuals that really have no association whatsoever with the organization. And but, you know, it, it's taken as gospel because it's coming from law enforcement. Well, when you look at you know, you look up the Aryan Brotherhood mm -hmm. and you look at what they do in prison, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, you know, the work they put in, it's drug trafficking, extortion, inmate prostitution, and murder for hire. Yes. Is, was that accurate back then as well? I think so, yes. Um, you know, when I talk about controlling your resources, that's actually what I'm talking about. So you have a, um, obviously a limited population, but it could be as high as 3,500 and even more. And so it's a small city. So the idea is, is that if you're introducing um, drugs, narcotics into the institution, then that's one of your resources. If you're making uh, alcohol, at Folsom we had two stills. So you had single still and double distill, and that's sold. You have prostitution, as you correctly point out. You have loan sharking. You have stores. Um, back then an individual could receive a 50-pound package from home. So that was another means by which to generate revenues. So on average, oh, I think that the FBI at one point estimated that uh, the brand took uh, 3.5 million out of Folsom in 1978 alone. And I think that's fairly accurate. Okay. The inmate prostitution part, how yeah. does that work exactly? Well, you, what you have is you have individuals who um, are either turned out or that they're... Um, gay by choice and um, essentially they become the women behind the walls and um, and so they're prostituted um, along that line so you have a stable you have an individual that pimps that stable and um, you have your revenues as a result of that you know the greatest value i think probably with uh, prostitutes behind the iron gates um, 
is their resources, their source of information, you know, because they're intermingling with all the races and uh, they're gathering information. They're bringing that information by way of counterintelligence, even as it relates to staff, because they're also being prostituted to staff. So it um, is extremely viable from a business perspective. Well, I mean, just today we had, we did a post. There's a, a post that's basically circling around the internet. There was a guy uh, named Aaron Cox who was locked up for 32 months in the state of uh, Pennsylvania Corrections Department. And he basically describes how when he was 20 years old, he was young and he was stupid. He got busted for a gun and two ounces of cocaine. He got sent to state prison for only 32 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he got there, he was a little skinny kid and his cellmate was a big muscular guy. And essentially he became a prison wife. Yes. And he agreed to basically have sex with this man. He, he said that he never, the guy never prostituted him mm -hmm. to other people. He basically kept them to himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, this happens actually, you know, very often. Yeah. And he actually said there's a name for it called protective pairing. It is protective pairing. In other words, the individual that takes him in, first he becomes a, what we call a cell mouse. And so he, he launders, he cleans up the cell, he cooks, he does things like that. But if he is in fact turned out um, to become um, a woman uh, in that context, um, then yes, he's, it's, he's paired with that individual and that becomes that individual's uh, wife. I've seen many of those relationships turn into um, extremely dangerous situations uh, because of um, jealousy, somebody attempting to push up on that individual's um, girl and um, is killed as a result. I mean, you, you coming into this situation, I mean, you know, you've been free up to 22 years old and suddenly you're going in and, and men are being wives and being prostituted and, and, and just the insanity of this all. Uh, how did you really get your head around all that? Well, it isn't to say that I wasn't approached by um, queens at the time. I was, you know, they'll slide up next to you as you're walking down center cor corridor and talk about, ooh, baby, ooh, baby, I need a daddy. And they're serious. But, you know, my response once I understood what I was dealing with was, um, I hear you, sweetheart, but I don't use. So it's a matter of respect. I always treated um, individuals that were doing that with me uh, with respect. And I think that was appreciated. So um, it's all in how you deal with things. It's your mindset. It's your demeanor. It's your character. Um, and how you approach the situation in which you're in. If you're going to allow yourself to be dominated, then you will be dominated. Um, that's not my character. Well, the, the murder for hire part. Yes. How exactly did that work? Well, it's the best example, I suppose, is in um, with uh, John Gotti, for instance. Now, John Gotti was under the Aryan Brotherhood's protection in the feds. So one of the things from a business perspective that the brand looked at was picking up contracts from the Italian mob uh, to carry out for them. That would, that would be the highest point of that murder for hire concept that you're talking about. Within the concept of uh, the 70s and prison, um, it was extremely rare. Uh, you had individuals who did engage in that, um, but... Um, you know, I'm sitting here right now trying to think of an instance that I can give you by way of example, and I can't think of one. You had many knife fights, um, but back then all that was head up. You didn't have assassinations, you had knife fights. Um, so that if you had a, a murder for hire, um, that usually involved drugs, and uh, that was usually the payoff relative to that. You want to remember, Vlad, that back then a pack of Lemax, a pack of Camels, tailor-maids, would facilitate a murder. So pretty cheap. You joined the Aryan Brotherhood and within a year, you actually became a leader in that group. I did, yes. And you became a, a commissioner, a California commissioner I did. of the AB. Mm -hmm. Yes. So at that point, you were a shot caller. 
Yes. So what were the type of things that you were doing in that leadership role at that point? Well, my focus, one of the reasons I rose to a position of leadership was one, because of my physical prowess, the various knife fights I'd been in. So that was a, a proven commodity, if you will, that was an asset to the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, but um, I also took steps even before rising to that level uh, to stop the drug use by the members. You want to remember that the Aryan Brotherhood at that time had control of all the resources in Old Folsom and all the resources in San Quentin. And as I said, that represented a lot of money. But all that money was going into the arms of the membership. They were all drug addicts. And uh, just bad business. Um, I'm not a drug addict, never have been. And so I looked at it from a different perspective, that the revenues that were being generated, tens of thousands of dollars, um, were being used so that the membership could party and live large and just kick back. Um, so my focus was to turn that create an infrastructure that was business orientated and invest those resources in a legitimate enterprise. I mean, it's not novel. Many, many organizations have done it. And um, this, uh, in my opinion, this organization at that time was um, ripe for making that turn towards organized crime. And that was really my interest was organized crime. Um, well, at one point, Charles Manson ended up in prison in Folsom. He did, yeah. And the Aryan Brotherhood had some sort of level of connection with Manson at one point and the Manson family. Well, yes, they did. I used uh, Manson's uh, girls as a resource to smuggle knives and other weapons into old Folsom. But uh, the thing to remember about uh, Charlie was that uh, Charlie was a punk and uh, literally a punk, as well as a pedophile. So, you know, where he, he had the um, so-called charisma to move these youngsters out there on the street, mostly women, but um, to their credit, intelligent women, but um, obviously not emotionally intelligent, that were looking apparently for some kind of guidance. He, uh, he played them and he used them. But he himself as an individual um, was not well thought of by the Aryan Brotherhood and was simply used for the resources that he had, which were substantial. Well, at that point, did Manson have the swastika uh, on his forehead or no? He did, yeah. You know, he, he did that, um, um, I think, while he was still in the county jail. But it wasn't, if not, then it wasn't too long after he hit uh, um, prison, the joint, um, that he did that. And um, his girls followed. But um, I was in communication with most of them at um, um, Chino, where they were housed. And then I was in communication with a number of them on the street. Uh, there were a number of them that were associated back then with an organization called Tribal Thumb. And uh, they were interested in putting together a commune. You want to remember that uh, back in the 70s, uh, the idea of a egalitarian society was very big on the agenda of most um, revolutionary forces. And so this was a gr group of girls that were attended Berkeley, uh, University of California at Berkeley. And um, I did recruit them to smuggle weapons in, and uh, they did smuggle those weapons in. And uh, I continued that relationship with them uh, and as well as individuals uh, on the street. To Charlie's credit, I suppose, uh, there were individuals like Sandra Good and, and uh, Squeaky Fromm, whom I also talked to. Um, that remained loyal to Charlie, um, but just that. Well, you know, when you see these interviews with Charles Manson, he looks like a crazy person. But in terms of off camera, in terms of, you know, your relationship, was yeah. Manson crazy or was it all an act? It was all an act, Vlad. You know, I spent 10 years in lockup with Charlie and um, I know him on a very, very intimate level. Um, I know his fears. I mean, he's passed over now, but, you know, then I knew his fears, his anxieties, and what he would do was that he had, um, he had a portfolio of choreographed um, acts that he would just kind of, you know, pull off the shelf, 
and it depended on who, whom he was talking to, whether it was a woman or a man. And, um, but if you listen to him closely um, in all those interviews, he's not really saying anything at all. <laughs> um, and um, he's just bumping his gums. You know, Charlie is one of the original jawjackers. It's a term I use to describe most methamphetamine users, but I now find that uh, in my experience with the internet, that the internet's full of jawjackers. And um, they just can't seem to help themselves. And Charlie was one of them individuals. You know, the media made Charlie um, is really what it comes down to. You know, the, there's no question that the crimes in which he was associated with were heinous. And um, I can understand why the media did make him that way. Um, they were atrocious crimes. Right. I mean, from what I understand, a lot of members in the Aryan Brotherhood didn't like him because he murdered a pregnant Sharon Tate. That's correct. So you weigh that against the resources that he has available to him. Um, you don't allow him to become too close, but you do give him protection. And uh, because there were a lot of people that wanted to kill him. Hmm. But, you know, um, I mean, it's no different. I spent time, the same 10 years that I spent with Charlie, I spent with Sirhan Sirhan and Juan Corona and other individuals of that ilk, if you will. And it really all renders down to the same thing. Um, it's a matter of providing protection for them and utilizing whatever resources they have available to them to the benefit of the organization. Well, uh, here you are at Folsom yes. and you're sort of building your stature and you're building the Aryan Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And then there was a situation where you stabbed 16 members of the Black Gorilla family. Well, that one was, day? Yeah, that was a one day altercation, but there was a lot that led up to that. I'd been in a head up knife fight with Yogi Pinnell after I re declined his offer to join the Black Panthers. And I defeated him, but I was shot in the process. Now I was shot while he was running from me. So that kind of mm, created a split between the Black Panthers and BGF. So there were a number of other fights that followed that. And uh, eventually what they did was they brought the National Guard in and they checked for knives and they found them all and everybody thought that that was it well the bgf and the black panthers took to using bones out of the kitchen and uh hardening them with uh, floor wax uh, as their knives but i had been working with these girls out of berkeley uh, charlie's uh, resources again and i had them smuggling buck knives so the incident of the 16 people being stabbed on the yard was it was uh, wendell norris and myself we each had a buck knife, and it was a um, about a four-on-one situation. There was maybe not that great. Figure between 30 and 40 of them, and uh, maybe at best, eight to 10 of us. Um, but only two of us had knives. So Wendell and I stood back to back, and they rushed us. And in the course of rushing us, um, 16 of them were pretty well bloodied. Um, matter of fact, it was a blood bath. And um, Wendell and I both used the blood from them on our knives to re-keister the weapons. But uh, the problem with that is, is that uh, the BGF uh, told the authorities that, uh, actually they didn't tell the authorities, they told the press that the authorities had smuggled buck knives in and made them available to the Aryan Brotherhood to use on them. That wasn't true. But uh, I didn't discount the fact but as a result of that, um, T.D. Bingham, myself, Spotsburg, and Bobby Moore were shipped to San Quentin as a result of that, um, that altercation that you're talking about. And now you're in San Quentin. Yes. And then there was a situation with the Mexican Mafia yes. when you were there. Mm -hmm. What happened there? That was Mo Farrell and Bosco. But um, Mo Farrell was Black Hand, and, um, which is the... Um, their mark, like the, the shamrock is for the brand, the black hand is for the Mexican mafia. Um, but uh, upon our arrival, TD and I were placed in the adjustment center, which uh, joins by way of overflow to death row. And uh, Bobby and Spots were uh, sent to East Block. But when we hit the tier, Mo sent me a kite and told me that um, an associate of the Aryan Brotherhood had disrespected him on the tier and that he was going to kill him in the morning. And um, so I shot him back a kite and told him not to kill him and that I would, I would deal with it. 
but um, Mo was a hothead. And that's eventually why the Emmy killed him. But um, he went out the next day, him and Bosco, and they stabbed um, Hawaiian John um, 18 times. But uh, they didn't kill him. So when T.D. and I were eventually cleared for the yard, we went out and, um, to make a long story short, beat the hell out of Mo Farrell and, and Bosco and a few other fellows that were on the yard. Uh, T.D. and I both took uh, five rounds each from shotgun for that effort. Um, but that uh, created a potential war between the Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood. <clears throat> Excuse me, which um, you know, had to be dealt with. And how was that dealt with? Well, um, Joe Morgan, who was the, uh, essentially the leader of the Mexican Mafia at the time, was housed in L.A. County Jail. So I made arrangements to have him pull me down to L.A. County Jail so that um, we could confer. And um, so that was done. And, uh, but in, on the way down to L.A. County Jail, I had an individual that um, I got into an altercation with. And uh, they had to stop the bus and take him off the bus, call an ambulance, and medevac him to the hospital. So when I arrived at the county jail, they wouldn't let me in the jail. Um, so they took me over to Chino, to Palm Hall, which is the hole there. And um, eventually we pulled Joe over from the L.A. County Jail to Chino and um, had our meeting and our talks there and um, worked out our differences. Right, you're talking about Joe Pegleg Morgan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, and he was actually the first non-Hispanic member of the Mexican Mafia. Yes. Yeah, you've got, I've got some great photos of him in 1967 at San Quentin with uh, the founders of the Mexican Mafia. And then, you know, he and, and uh, Benjamin Peters, Topo Peters, um, was really Joe's right-hand man. Um, but yes, you're, you're right. He was um, non-Mexican, non-Hispanic. Right. And, you know, years later, uh, there was a movie that came out called American Me. Right. Uh, you watched it? No. Uh, okay. Well, I interviewed uh, Danny Trejo, mm -hmm. who was an affiliate of the Mexican Mafia, yeah. but was not actually part of it. And essentially in the movie, um, you know, they, they showed the leader uh, of the Mexican Mafia getting raped mm -hmm. in juvenile. Mm-hmm. And after that movie came out, um, a bunch of people ended up getting killed yes. that were associated with the movie. Yes. Because, I mean, from what I understand, it wasn't true. And to depict that on a big screen like that really angered the Mexican Mafia. Yes. To the point where e Edward James Olmos, who starred and put the movie together, had a hit on him. And he, he did. And from what I understand, some of the people featured in that movie, like I think... Like a lot the, of got killed there was because of them being in that movie four out here and about i think six in prison six people got killed over american me yeah probably but yeah, just being eight. part of it yeah but and uh it was funny because i remember donald garcia another mexican m mafia but that got out and turned christian just straight out said you know uh, 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 they were uh, they were talking about no 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 and he go yeah that falls on you Eddie you know so you know there's a whole thing so you know about that oh I do yeah yeah that okay was... so w what did you hear about that well just that it was an open contract I mean um, you know I had a very good relationship with Joe and other members of the Mexican mafia and uh, they were upset about that uh, you want yeah. to remember at one point in time that coincides with this movie uh, Joe had a stroke. Um, and that's not widely known. So we had smuggled uh, steroids into the prison to help him contend with that. But he was dealing with um, a lot of inside uh, drama, individuals attempting to usurp uh, his standing within the Mexican mafia. So, but yeah, you're, you're right insofar as the movie upsetting the Mexican mafia. It did that. Yeah, I just looked it up while you're talking. Ten people were killed. That sounds about right. Yeah, like ten people that were used in the production as you know, uh, you know, either extras or were were used to to get you know in terms of getting background information and so forth. Uh, yeah, it was essentially a bloodbath over that movie. Yes. From what I understand, okay. uh, almost actually. Um, 
made a contribution, a financial contribution um, to one of the organizations aligned with uh, the Mexican mafia. And um, that squashed his contract. Okay, so he basically paid him off. That's what I'm told. Whether or not it's true, I couldn't tell you. But um, my sources, like yours, are, are fair. I mean, was the Mexican Mafia the biggest gang in San Quentin when you got there? Um, biggest Mexican gang, yes. But period, in terms of just raw numbers? Mm, probably, because I'm thinking, you know, the BGF had uh, a fairly substantial... Um, membership at that time in San Quentin. And so they were pretty strong. Um, and, but I would say it'd be a toss up between Mexican Mafia and the Black Gorilla family. Okay. So a situation happened, um, I guess in the early 80s, where an Aryan Brotherhood uh, member actually dropped out. Steve Barnes. Right. And they couldn't get to Steve Barnes because I guess, I mean, not only did Steve Barnes drop out, but he actually agreed to testify against other members of the AB, right? Yes. It's a little more complicated than that. You know, I mean, that the, you've, you've given, uh, I think, an adequate overview of that. But, uh, you know, Blinky Griffin and Junior Snyder, as a result of the potential war with the Mexican Mafia, assassinated a uh, young man named Steve Gibson, T-Bone Gibson. And Steve was witness to that. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, it made him paranoid. Um, so uh, as a result, he stepped away from the brand and cooperated with law enforcement in testifying against Blinky and Junior Snyder in court as a result of the death of T-Bone Gibson. Um, so as you probably know, his father was assassinated as a result of that. Right, because T. Barnes was in witness protection at the time. They couldn't get to him, so they ended up killing his father. Um, someone named Curtis Price yes. that did the murder, yes. right? Yes. And then after killing uh, the father, they also killed uh, a woman named Elizabeth Hickey, uh, who I guess knew about Price's involvement in the father's murder. Well. No, what happened was, is that Elizabeth Hickey, um, Curtis cultivated her, dated her. And then um, upon gaining entrance to her home, learned that she had a number of weapons that were her father's. And so he bludgeoned her to death, took the weapons, came back down south because she was in Northern California, and um, used a, a pistol uh, that belonged to Elizabeth Hickey's father, to shoot uh, Richard Barnes in the back of the head in his bedroom. Aha, uh -huh. got it. Well, was that the moment that you felt that you wanted to move away from the Aryan Brotherhood? Yeah, it was leading up to that. I mean, I think that's probably um, kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. I had been dealing with a number of issues, uh, not the least of which was the idea. The original discussion, for instance, about killing Richard Barnes, Steve Barnes' father, uh, was that uh, his wife and daughter be assassinated. And, um, you know, I was a part of that conversation. I was a part of that circle. And um, it went totally contrary to everything that uh, the brand was supposed to stand for and certainly what I believed I stood for by way of um, what a person would or would not do. And the taking of innocent life is bad enough, but uh, the very idea of contemplating taking a woman and her child's life um, was to so totally foreign to me that I argued against it. Ultimately, um, the only concession, I suppose, if you want to call it that, I got out of that is uh, they moved away from killing his wife and daughter to killing his mother and father. And ultimately what it ended up with was killing his father. And um, I was actually the only one that voted against that. So, um, yeah, it, it um, was very instrumental in um, my decision to step away from the brand. Okay, so murders would actually involve votes. Um, yes. 
Okay. And how many people are voting at a certain time? Well, at that time, you want to remember, we had just formed uh, the council and the commission and all that was going nationwide. And uh, so this was one of the um, aspects of moving toward organized crime. We were building an infrastructure um, and uh, this came up in the context, as a matter of fact, from Blinky, um, that because Steve, Stephen Barnes could not be had, that uh, the brand should kill his wife and daughter. Um, so it was, um, I, I suppose I should preface that with the idea that when Blinky and Junior killed T-Bone, uh, they got away with it. Um, Snyder hit him in the back and Blinky cut his throat and um, took his windpipe and his juggler and uh, just left him laying on a table on the yard and they got away with it. Well, Steve's testimony then became critical uh, relative to that. So whereas he otherwise would have gotten away with that, um, now he was looking at a life sentence uh, for the murder of T-Bone Gibson. And so he was advocating um, this, and of course, the logic in that mm, doesn't um, wash. I mean, if you just simply think about it, how is killing um, these individuals going to keep Steve from testifying? It's not. As a matter of fact, it's going to add to it. So then you move on to the, well, it'll deter others from doing the same in the future. Not likely. I mean, that's kind of like people saying that the death penalty is a deterrent to people committing murder to begin with. It's not. That's simple science. Um, so that was my argument, actually. But um, really what you're dealing with are individuals that um, are incapable, unfortunately, of seeing the logic in that. When you finally decided to turn and drop out, Yes. Um, were you involved in, in the Curtis Price uh, murder trial or no? I was, yes. Okay. So at that point, you approached the authorities and said that I'm going to cooperate on this murder? No. No, I just simply, I, I uh, told the lieutenant that I, need, I wanted to use the phone. And he pulled me out and took me up into his office. And I called uh, the director of corrections. And I told him that I was going to step away. So he flew down from Sacramento to San Quentin, and uh, he and um, a whole lot of law enforcement, feds and state both, um, met with me in New Miller Hospital. And um, so, you know, I was asked, uh, obviously, a lot of questions. Um, I was in part responsible for building the infrastructure of the brand at that time and um, controlling what was going on with the brand at San Quentin and Folsom. And um, so they were looking for intelligence and uh, not necessarily a testimony. But um, the Richard Barnes murder happened in LA County. So the LA sheriffs were there and their investigators talked to me. And um, so they wanted to know if I knew anything about it. And of course I did. And uh, I gave them that information, what I did know about it. And uh, so then they asked if I would be willing to testify in court as to that. And I agreed. Um, but that was in conjunction with mm, a whole lot of other cases. The Margot Compton assassination up in Oregon by the Hells Angels, her two six-year-old twin daughters, and uh, a few other murders. So this all happened simultaneously with all these people in this room. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Vlad, or not, but... No, no, it did. Okay. And the Hells Angels, were they affiliated with the Aryan Brotherhood as well? Yes. Okay. But they were still separate organizations, right? They were. You had individuals who were Aryan Brotherhood in prison, and when they stepped out, they'd put their Hells Angel patch on. And um, that's pretty much how it worked. But, you know, here you are. It, you cooperated, was it in 1984? Yes. Okay. So you were 33 years old yes. at the time. And for all these years, you pledged allegiance to this group. Uh, you were a shock caller. You were part of the commission. You were involved in a lot of crimes. You were involved in a lot of violence. You were involved in drug dealing and, and, and prostitution and so forth. 
how hard of a decision was it to say, I'm going to throw all this away, all the stuff that I claim to be part of, and now work against the organization? Um, I'd like to tell you that it, uh, it wasn't hard. But, you know, really what I was confronted with were two truths. The truth that I was living and the truth by which I was raised. I had to make a decision when I joined the brand um, that I was going to do things that were contrary to my own personal code. And I, and I did that. Um, I did that willingly and openly. Um, but when it comes to um, taking what I regard as innocent life, um, and that's what had occurred, and that's what was happening, that I would not be a part of that and would not condone that. So faced with that, um, it was not a difficult decision. Um, I simply was not going to be a part of that. Now, insofar as still going head up with somebody, um, that remains true to this day. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Um, those individuals, I mean, I hear it all the time. You know, aren't you afraid for your life? Aren't you this? Aren't you that? No, I'm living my life. I'm not, I'm not in the witness protection program. Um, you know, I haven't changed my name. Um, my address is common knowledge. Now, that's not a challenge, but it's to emphasize to you that, you know, I don't allow others to dictate how I live my life. And that applies now, and it applied back then. Well, at this point, you're being labeled a, a rat or a snitch or sure. whatever, whatever the terminology of that of that time is and you know based on prison politics you know there's probably a price on your head well there is i still have an open contract on me you know but the idea you want to remember that the idea of a rat is something that's used primarily by the organizations as a deterrent you know to those individuals that they're attempting to recruit you see so that's that's kind of like brainwashing if you will you you hear it a lot and again you you particularly hear it from the jawjackers and the front men for the various organizations, they're the ones that will use that term. I don't have a problem with it. You see, because here's the bottom line, Bat, Vlad. If you like chicken, grab a wing. It's that simple. <laughs> you know, you can jack your jaw all you want. If I'm chicken, grab a wing. That's a, that's a hell of a statement right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and ultimately, uh, Curtis Price for the, the double murder ended up getting the death penalty. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ended up dying on death row uh, in 2021 right. at the age of 74. So he wasn't actually executed, but he no, stayed yeah. on death row right. pretty much for all those years. He did. And was that, you know, his conviction was partially based on you taking the stand? I was the principal witness in that case. Mm -hmm. And so I, I take the position that um, his conviction was based on me taking the stand. By you, were you the highest ranking member of the AB to actually turn at that point? Yes, at any point. At any point? Yes. Okay, and with that, you are now giving them information about how the organization functions and the inner workings and so forth. Mm -hmm. So did that start to kind of tear down the Aryan Brotherhood and, and their influence uh, you know, around the country? It did. I mean, obviously, whenever you um, give up the information relative to the infrastructure, the inner workings, um, you know, even even codes, if you will, uh, to carry out um, escape attempts and just the activities of the organization. So, yes, um, it uh, required that they restructure. OK, and there was this one case you testified uh, as a witness where I guess they had to sneak you in in like a hollowed out vending machine. Yeah, that was the Margot Compton case. That uh, was two Hells Angel members that had killed Margot Compton, her two six-year-old twin daughters. You know, they wrapped their arms around her, these little girls' teddy bear and capped them in the head while they made Margot watch them, and they capped her in the head. They previously shot her boyfriend on the couch in the head. Um, they did this because she testified against um, Buck Garrett, who was the second in command of the Hells Angels, for a pimping and pandering case. You know, he got four years for that. He would have done half of that. Um, but the feds, she testified for the feds. They hit her out in Oregon, but she contacted her connection here in the city. And, um, you know, the city is an HA stronghold. So the connection gave up her location. Buck Garrett sent two shooters up there. So I testified against Buck Garrett and I testified against one of the shooters. 
They were both convicted. But um, the courthouse at that time was, you know, full of H.A. And um, there were, oh, I'll just call them rumors, that um, they'd found out which transportation car I was on, so they planted a bomb on that, so they switched transportation cars. They put me in a, a sub uh, substation. Now, this I know to be a fact, at least. Um, and uh, at one point, one of the deputies brought a Polaroid to me and showed me an individual, and I identified him. So they x-rayed him and found that he had a 25 auto keister, and his, his assignment was to assassinate me in the substation. Um, and then the other one, perhaps the most bizarre one, was that... Uh, uh, an individual dressed as a priest was attempting to snipe me from a building outside the courtroom. So with that in mind, they hollowed out a vending machine and stuck me in it and ran me into the courthouse. Well, I think in 1985, you testified against Joseph Michael O'Rourke. Yeah, Joe O'Rourke, little Joe O'Rourke, yes. Okay, and that was over a murder of Ricky Helt. Yes. And uh, I guess it was part of a dispute about uh, basically stealing drugs from O'Rourke's girlfriend? Yes. And you cooperated in that trial I uh, did. as well? Yes. And I guess on the stand, that's when you kind of talked about the inner workings of the Aryan Brotherhood and everything else like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, but even with your testimony, he ended up getting found not guilty? Yes. Okay, because I guess there was still a reasonable doubt in the whole situation. Yeah, I think so, and, and, uh, and I can see why. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, they had a pretty good jury. The jury foreman was an attorney. Um, you know, that can go either way for you. But, you know, my position is that um, I'm not a witness for the prosecution or the defense. I talk to both. When they send investigators to me, I talk to both. When I take the stand, you know, my position is, is I'm there to tell what I know and only that. I'm not advocating for the prosecution or the defense. So, and that was the case with Little Joe O'Rourke. Um, you know, I went into court, I took the stand, I told what I knew and left it at that. Well, I mean, this whole time when you're cooperating, you're still in prison yes. the entire time. Yes. So as you're going through all this, how are they really keeping you safe while you're locked up? Well, they're not really worried about that. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's a mis misnomer perhaps. I mean, at one time in, in the unit, they have special housing units. I was in a restricted housing unit. There was only, I think, four, four or five of us in there. It, um, it was a highly secure unit. You know, they would fly in a helicopter, put you on the helicopter, fly you out to court, that type thing. Um, but, you know, whether or not you're safe, you know, that's anyone's guess. You know, anybody can be had. I don't care who you are. Um, well, but are they keeping you in protective cu in uh, protective custody this whole time? No, not at that time. It wasn't protective custody. It was uh, called a restricted housing unit. So, uh -huh. um, eventually, I did end up in in protective housing in Corcoran. That's where I was with uh, Charlie Manson and Sir Hans Sirhan and others. Um, but at that time, no, I was out to court uh, probably three years. So. After leaving the gang, mm -hmm. you essentially pledged a vow of nonviolence? I did. And that basically means that you're no longer going to be attacking anyone, you're no longer going to try to kill anyone, and so forth. And I guess there was a situation with the Mexican Mafia, a hitman that actually attacked you in 2015. Yes. So what happened there? Um, well, unfortunately, I let him get behind me. But I'd worked a double shift, and I had a fellow that was going to the parole board the next morning, and uh, he'd asked for my help, so I was sitting on a bench with him, going over the paperwork, and the um, assailant came from behind me, did a roundhouse kick, hit me in the face, took me head over heels over the back of the bench. I went uh, semi-unconscious, but he had a box cutter, and he reached in, grabbed my hair, reached in to cut my throat, um, I couldn't see, but I could still hear. And um, so in feeling his movements, uh, he reached in to cut my throat at the uh, windpipe and juggler, and um, I was able to block it, and he cut my ear in half instead. And um, second time in, he kind of choked up on my hair and reached in again, 
and I blocked it again and he caught the back of my throat. He missed the anterior artery by about uh, one millimeter, one centimeter. Um, and then the third time I got my sight back, so I took the weapon away from him and um, waited for staff to respond after I took the weapon away from him, as opposed to use it on. I mean, in truth, um, I thought about breaking his neck, um, but didn't, and just simply took the weapon away and um, waited for staff to arrive. Okay. And... By 2019, after being up for parole, I guess, what, 18 times? Yes. They finally granted you parole. They did. And was that a situation where you, you know, were attacked and you end up not retaliating? Was that part of the decision for them to actually uh, grant you parole? I think so. I mean, that's coupled with the fact that at the time that that was going on, I, my wife and I had started a group called Live, Learn, and Prosper in the prison. And so we were running groups every day of individuals. It was the influence that my actions had upon those groups, I think, is what the board and the administrators looked at. Uh, in other words, I was practicing what I was preaching to them. I was talking to other gang dropouts and, and other individuals and telling them that um, there were other methods available to them other than violence. Um, and so in this one particular instance, that held true. And um, that example uh, had um, a huge impact on the population. Um, I guess their thinking was that if I could um, take a knife away from somebody and not use it on them, uh, after he just cut my ear off and, and my throat, cut my throat, that... Um, they too um, could seek alternatives. Oftentimes people confuse a vow of nonviolence with pacifism. I'm not a pacifist. Um, I want to make that clear. Um, but um, my vow of nonviolence remains in place. Well, uh, at the time, Governor Gavin Newsom could have actually stepped in and reversed the decision. Yes, he could have but he actually took no action and allowed you to get paroled. He did. You know, one of the things to note was around that time, there was another guy named Rene Enriquez, who was, I guess, more or less your counterpart in the Mexican mafia, uh, who ended up dropping out and cooperating with the police. Um, you know, he was actually granted parole several times, but Newsom would come in and actually deny it every time. Yes. Why do you think that was? I think it had primarily had to do with Boxer's history. Um, you know, he wrote the book, um, I think it was called The Black Hand, and, um, you know, he provided information, testimony, and the like. Uh, but uh, one of the things that he didn't reveal was that um, uh, one of his crimes was statutory rape. And uh, whenever you have a crime against a woman, particularly, um, and a sex crime at that, um, I think that's something that's looked on. I, I think, actually, that um, our society and, and those who administer to our society um, will accept violence although rape is violence, um, but, you know, like knife fights and being shot and shootings and the like that happen in prison, as opposed to um, a crime against a child or a crime against a woman. And um, I happen to agree with that. Well, then in 2020, you were officially released from prison. Yes. Uh, by that time, how many years had you served? 45. 45 years. So you essentially spent twice as much time in prison than you spent outside. Yes. You know, I, I stepped away from the brand in 84, so I spent an additional 35 years in prison after stepping away from the brand. You know, this wasn't, um, this wasn't a 30 pieces of silver situation, or I was in trouble, so I was testifying to get out of trouble or to save myself. Um, it wasn't any of that, and that's why I spent an additional 35 years in prison. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I mean, did you expect to get out a little earlier considering the cooperation? No. My cooperation was never considered by the board. I wouldn't allow it. Really? Why is that? Because that's not why I cooperated. You know, I wasn't interested in um, receiving anything. You either, my thinking was that I either do what I'm going to do because I believe it's the right thing to do or I'm not going to do it. Now, there were decisions I made in the RICO prosecutions where I declined. I told them no. You know, and, and that's my prerogative. Um, and um, so I elected not to be involved in some cases. Um, but in other cases, I did elect to be involved. Margot Compton was the killing of two girls. Curtis Price was the killing of uh, Steve's father. Um, there are those who say, well, you're in for a penny, in for a pound. I don't believe that. You know, um, the discretion and, and the decision is mine and remains mine. Um, so the, that upset a lot of people within law enforcement. And so, you know, I got a lot of pushback from law enforcement, uh, a lot of setups. Um, Attempts on my life as a result of law enforcement setting me up. So, I mean, um, that comes with the territory. When you make a decision like I made, they want what they want for the reasons that they want it. Well, what was it like? You, know, you, you went in in 19, was it 74? Yes. And you come out in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the world, to say the world is different is, is an understatement is a massive understatement. It is. Uh, when you came in, I mean, th there were no cell phones, there yeah. was no internet, there were no electric cars there. I mean, it, 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 there's just too many differences to name. Uh, yes. It's just a completely different planet that you're now stepping into. We are in agreement. Yeah. It, what was the hardest um, adjustment in the beginning? It remains the hardest adjustment, and that's sensory overload. Um, I... Um, what they call post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And um, I didn't think that I would um, fall victim to that, but I certainly did. It, uh, they dropped me off in the middle of East LA. And um, that was an experience. You want to remember when I went to prison, I came from the mountains. Remember I talked about the idea of taking my own life because I couldn't live in a cage. Well, I lived in that cage for 45 years. So that's a controlled environment. Then I come out of that cage into East LA. You know, in the first week that I was there, three cats around the corner were capped in the head. One was stabbed to death out in front of the place I was staying. I thought, this isn't much different. So, um, but yeah, to answer your question, sensory overload, there, there are a lot of things. I mean, I was not computer literate. Um, so the learning curves are astronomical. I was fortunate enough to educate myself while in prison. When I came to prison, I couldn't read or write. But while in prison, I learned to read and write and then educated myself. And um, so uh, nonetheless, um, the learning curve was enormous and remains enormous. Um, I live in an area right now that um, is fairly isolated, um, not a lot of people. And um, I can practice my way of life. If I remain a native and I continue to follow that way and, and uh, practice that way. So that helps me immensely. But I also work as an AOD counselor and a life coach. But, um, you know, that requires internet access. And right now I'm forbidden internet access. I'm working on that. Um, so um, it's a matter of just working and um, moving forward and hopefully evolving in my humanity. Well, when you look at uh, the Aryan Brotherhood uh -huh. these days, yeah, it seems like the neo-Nazis and the Aryans are essentially one organization. Yeah. Uh, it's a very racist organization. A non-white person cannot join. A Jewish person cannot join. Right. Um, you know, when you look at what's its what it evolved, uh, evolved into, what are your thoughts about it? My thoughts parallel those of um, all the hate groups and of which there are plenty, unfortunately. You know, it's one of the biggest issues probably that I deal with. I mean, I, I give talks, I do lectures at synagogues and other churches, 
and before other groups. And uh, it's primarily about um, that very hate that you're talking about and where that comes from. You know, these uh, latest mass shootings is a good example. You know, um, the very idea that uh, youngsters are being recruited, um, just like jihad. You know, I did some work over in the Netherlands with the, um, the Hague and the policymakers at the Hague relative to their jihad unit. And um, it's along the same lines. You're, you're dealing with a hate group. Um, whatever the premise for their hate, that becomes irrelevant. In this country, we're dealing with white supremacy. It's off the hook. Um, the problem is, is that um, nobody is really talking to anybody that actually understands or knows anything about white supremacy or hate or the recruitment process and everything that goes along with that. And you're right, the Aryan Brotherhood and the neo-Nazis and the skinheads are at the forefront of that. And, um, um, I mean, if you just look at the Southern Law Center and what they're doing. But I think one of the things that needs to happen is um, educating. Educating the public about where this hate comes from. And distinguishing, you know, between the politics of that hate and the reality of that hate. The propaganda associated with it. And what's their motive? What are they after? You know, the, the so-called whites now being disenfranchised. That's ridiculous. Uh, last year, you ended up showing up in the news uh, all over the place. Yes. Where you were actually charged with fraud. I was. Um, you were charged with uh, frauding $400,000 in unemployment benefits. Yes. What's going on with that case? Well, the case is still pending, but... Um, Nothing is really going on with it other than the fact that they've charged me with it. Um, they have no evidence. They have an individual that says that, uh, as a former leader of the Aryan Brotherhood, that he just did what I told him to do. But, uh, and they've now given him a deal to testify against me. Um, but uh, it would be ridiculous of me to say that uh, I'm not concerned about it. I am. So it's it's really a matter of uh, dealing with the evidence that they think they have, which I believe I will be able to do. I have a, an amazing defense team, uh, Curtis Briggs and, and the outfit out of uh, the city here um, over on Gary Street, um, Pier 5 law offices. And, uh, you know, they took my case pro bono because they see the politics associated with that. You know, the, it begged the question where... Um, I, I, my wife and I are the ones that provided the information that facilitated this investigation because we saw what was happening. And the investigator in that case, the chief investigator in that case, has attempted to turn it around um, because I'm involved. And he sees the politic associated with that. Um, you know, how that works at this point, we're unsure. But um, by way of example, they accused me of laundering money through Live, Learn, and Prosper, uh, its bank account and its website. Well, all this investigator had to do was ask for the bank statements, and he would have seen that that wasn't true. But instead, what he did is he went to the Sacramento Bee and he released this article about um, how I was laundering money from these so-called homeless people. These weren't homeless people. This was a crew that was working out of Ukiah on behalf of this individual who's now testifying against me. You see, most of them dope fiends. That don't make them bad people, but most of them dope fiends. This crew's been together for years. This fella and his, and his sister were operating it, you see. But the investigator isn't even looking at that. And the irony is, is that when he was the head of the task force over in Ukiah, he knows all these people, but now he calls them homeless people? They're not homeless people. They knew exactly what they were doing and how they were doing it. And there's not one shred of evidence that ties me to this, not even circumstantial. The only thing he's got going for him right now is this witness. And like I said, that we'll contend with that in court. It's that simple. Meanwhile, I have to live my life. So I have to rehabilitate the LLP because they've, they've made allegations in the press that are absolutely untrue. Now he comes at me and he says, can I get your bank statements? I said, no, I'm sorry, you can't. 
You can get them at the time the jury gets them. When they make the determination that what you said in the press was a lie. You see, but unfortunately, not always, but often that's how law enforcement works. They want what they want. I said it earlier, for the reasons that they want it. In this particular case, um, they want me. The investigator has told witnesses in our case not to get involved. He's discouraged them from cooperating. And he's openly said that he disagreed with Newsom's decision to let me out of prison and that he's going to put me back in prison for the rest of my life. So is it personal? I don't know. At this point, I don't care. All I know is that uh, in the press releases that he's made not only absurd allegations, but false allegations. So that when we get to the point when we disprove this, either before a jury or it's all dismissed before we even get to a jury, then we're going to have to take issue with that by way of civil litigation, and we will. Well, yeah, you've only been out for two years. Right. If that. Well, if you look at it, I'm, I'm not into uh, uh, fraud. That's, I guess, a white-collar crime. Um, you know, I started the business from in prison and continued the business once I got out of prison, and that business continues to this day. Um, and it's difficult. It's been difficult on my wife. They tried to implicate my wife. Um, and, you know, I think that upsets me more than anything. But um, unfortunately, we have, to, we have to deal with this. We have to contend with it, and we will. Yeah, well, I hope it works out for you. I, I mean, believe you just got out. <laughs> yes. you, you just got out yeah. after doing, you know, a lot of years. Yeah. Uh, well, Michael Thompson, I appreciate you, uh, you know, sharing your story uh, to actually be part of an organization as fearsome as the Aryan Brotherhood and to actually turn against that organization because of your ideals and not, not to turn on it just to get out of jail quickly, but to actually turn because you felt what, what they were doing was wrong yes. uh, really just shows your character. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I hope whatever case you're going through right now uh, works out. You can get back to, to living your life, you know, outside of a cage, which is where we all belong. Uh, yes. You know, I don't think people realize, you know, I, I did a few days in jail here and there for little things. And, you know, the shock, you know, that you talked about of someone who's used to moving around the world freely to suddenly being in a small cage. Yes. It is, um, it's something that, no one really comprehends unless they actually go through it. I'm glad you said that, Vlad, because whether you do one day or 45 years, it's the same to me. Yeah. That one day is the same. To put another human being in a cage is inhumane. So, you know, one of the things I'm after here is judicial reform, and I think I have a bully pulpit, if you will, for that, based on those 45 years. I know what it's like to live in a cage, and um, I can address that. And I think there are more humane ways. I think Europe is leading the way in that. You see, and uh, they're very innovative. I'm not saying that people shouldn't be incarcerated, that there shouldn't be punishment to go along with the crime. I'm saying that the punishment should be humane. And this disproportionate um, arrest and conviction relative to the minorities, so-called minorities, whether they be blacks or Mexican or whatever they may be, is outrageous. You see, uh, a black man in this state doesn't stand a chance. That's already a strike against him. You know, we talk about that three strike, strikes crap. That's already a strike against him. The fact that he's come up in poverty, that's the second strike against him. And then if he unfortunately has to go before an all-white jury, he's done. And I think our prison system shows that, demonstrates that. Hmm. Very well said. Very well said. Well, Michael Thompson, uh, Appreciate you sharing your story. I wish you all the best. And like I said, I hope the case that you were, we were working on gets dismissed and you're able to recover some money in the civil trial as well. Thank you, Vlad. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Good to Until be Until next time. All right. Peace. Peace.